None of us would be here today if it wasn't for the vision and energy and drive of one man, the founder of our school, President John Lenchowski. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a great pleasure and an honor to have you all here. Uh, I am, this is one of the, the, the most wonderful events uh, in the life of the Institute. It's bittersweet because we're going to miss so many of our great students who've been with us for quite some time. I want to first of all thank everybody who has made this school possible. I want to thank our incredibly dedicated trustees, our benefactors, our faculty, uh, extraordinary faculty of, of scholar practitioners, our guest lecturers, our staff, our interns, our many friends and helpers, volunteers, the spouses and the families of those who work in our vineyards for this cause, and ultimately our students. IWP is a school, but it is also a cause. It is the cause of the defense of our country, of decent civilization around the world, and ultimately the cause of peace. It is not just any peace, but it is peace with liberty and justice. Liberty and justice are impossible if one is unrealistic about the flaws and frailties of human nature. And that is why well-educated people have read and studied tragedy. And when one understands the capacity of man to commit evil against his fellow man, one then realizes the necessity for the rule of law, for law enforcement, and for such things as armed force, intelligence, economic power, and the other instruments that ensure peace internationally. But it is not sufficient to have justice and the instruments of power to enforce it, because justice alone does not make for the kind of human community that is the true foundation of peace. Genuine peace also requires that love of neighbor that transcends the requirements of justice. And that means respect for the dignity of the individual human person and the capacity for mercy and forgiveness, whether between individuals or among nations. Success in this cause requires great leadership. And in our fields of endeavor, our mission is to develop leaders who understand the realities of, of the world, who understand the various arts of statecraft, which, by which we mean the, very, the, the different instruments of power, and how they are integrated in national strategy. One of the most important goals of our curriculum is to get our students to think in integrated strategic terms, to know how their own art of statecraft coordinates with others, it is an extraordinarily difficult intellectual challenge that is made all the harder by the tendency and the various political and bureaucratic by the tendency of the various political and bureaucratic cultures in our foreign affairs and defense agencies not to think beyond the confines of their specific missions so that they can contribute to the larger national effort. As you can see in the imagery of our commencement program. Many, the many arts of statecraft are represented, represented by musical instruments. The larger lesson of strategic integration is that the brass section must understand that there's a time of the symphony to listen to the harp or the flute. And this requires not only integrated strategic thinking by each of the instrumentalists, but also by the conductors of the orchestra themselves. It would be nice if some of those conductors were even aware of some of the instruments in their own orchestra. Understanding why we use these arts of statecraft is central to IWP's mission. We, we do so for the defense, we, we use these arts for the defense of a rare and precious civilization that for all of our past sins has a greater record of social, political, and economic self-improvement, arguably, than any other society in human history. This is a civilization that has maximized human potential and avoided its waste more than any other in human history. This is a society that, more than any other, has enabled ordinary people to be free and self-governing. But to appreciate and even to love this country and civilization, 
one must understand it. And that is why we teach the political philosophical principles that make it possible. To achieve freedom and self-government, and as John Adams said, the preservation of our constitutional order, requires something else beyond understanding and appreciation. It requires virtuous people who are capable of controlling themselves. There is no self-government without self-control. And this is a moral issue. That is why a huge part of IWP's ethos concerns what kind of people our students turn out to be. Our students and faculty have often heard me refer to the ancient historian Livy, who taught that the surest way to defeat a foreign enemy is to spread amongst his population the ideas of selfishness and hedonism, a people whose priority is selfish pleasure-seeking has a weak national immune system. That immune system represents the strength of a nation's convictions, its commitment to certain values and principles, its ability, therefore, to recognize both internal and external threats to those values and principles, and ultimately its ability to protect them morally, politically, economically, diplomatically, and militarily. Since history has taught that corruption in a nation's leadership easily spreads to the society at large, our nation's ability to resist moral decline depends heavily on the character of our leadership. Because our graduates are destined for leadership positions, and some are in such positions already, it makes a huge difference as to what kind of people they are. Character begins with consciousness of the virtues that make up good character. It is exhibited in how you behave when no one is looking. It involves cultivation of conscience. It involves cultivation of the will. It involves the development of good habits, because habits become destiny. The professions we teach at IWP involve the most sensitive functions of government. They involve questions of war and peace and of life and death and people responsible for making and implementing policy on life and death matters must be people of good character. There is a great word in ancient Greek that describes much of what good character entails. It is arete. This word has no exact translation in English, but broadly speaking, it connotes virtue, nobility, courage, strength, and fortitude. Arete also connotes excellence that results from being all you can be. And this in turn was explicitly linked by the ancient Greeks to knowledge and its constant pursuit. Not for its own sake or for mere utilitarian purposes, but for the realization of virtue. Arete has the same root as the more familiar ancient Greek word aristos, which connotes superior ability and nobility. Ultimately, according to Aristotle, arete is a disposition of mind toward choosing the good and prudent course based on knowledge and excellence. So there's truly a link between the knowledge which our students have pursued in which we encourage them to continue to pursue throughout their lives and the kind of character they will develop. A huge part of the kind of character that is necessary for leadership in statecraft has to do with personal and intellectual honesty and integrity. This includes a commitment to the truth and the effort to discern the truth. Here, courage is essential. You have to have the courage of your convictions, the courage to see the truth when so many about you are willfully blind, the courage to tell the truth to power. Here, humility is essential, and so is acute sensitivity to the dangers of hubris. We here teach our students that there are two kinds of people. The, those who want to do something and those who want to be somebody. On the one hand, mission-oriented people, 
And on the other hand, people who are interested in power, position, and satisfaction of one's ego. We at IWP want our students to be mission-oriented people. And when they are tempted to embark on self-serving maneuvers for personal power, we want them to resist the temptation. Humility keeps people on track to achieving a mission because the mission is the cause higher than oneself. Hubris engulfs people who simply want to be something. It is a spiritual disease of the ego. It's deadly because it derails a leader from pursuing a mission and puts him or her on a slippery slope to the Machiavellian intrigues and all the dishonesty and baseness involved in them. Finally, let me mention prudence, which is one of the great lessons that we always teach, because there is no template for perfect foreign or national security policy. So much of everything involves prudential judgment. At one level, prudence is the ability to ex exercise wisdom, reason, caution, and discretion in the conduct of policy. But in a larger sense, prudence is the application of universal principles to particular situations. What prudence requires first is knowledge of universal moral principles. It is that vir virtue that enables a person to discern good ends, achieve good ends, and ultimately to be good oneself. With the education that you graduates have received, both intellectually and, we hope, in cultivating your consciences, we anticipate great professional achievements in service of our country, but we particularly hope to see the exercise of those virtues that make for genuine statesmanship. It's been a privilege to be your professor, to see how seriously you've taken your studies and your vocations, and our country expects good, great things from you. Thank you. God bless you.